to not necessarily describe everything that's on their poster, but to encourage you to come and talk with them to find out more about what's on the, the posters that are going to be available for viewing this evening at the reception and then throughout the conference uh, in Appleton Tower, where the main sessions are. Now, rather than spend time trying to get you all in order, we're simply going to ask you, the poster presenters, to pay attention to the screen. When you see your poster appear, come up, take the microphone, Les will then start uh, the, the, the timer. If nobody steps up to a particular poster, we are aware there are one or two people who may not have made it here yet. If nobody steps up after five seconds, we'll move on to the next poster. So you need to keep your wits about you. Okay. Les, is there... Uh, uh, hello. 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 Either my, can someone turn my charisma up? Hello? No? Is there a... If not, do you want to use the... Hello. No? Is that better? No. Sorry? I've got the room stream. Oh. Uh. Sorry. This isn't, this isn't going to be very good for the web if the people presenting don't have a... So apologies, people on the web. Well, the people presenting are going to be using uh, those mics, which are... Oh, being okay. To oh, no apologies. Well, th um, thank you very much. This is a, this is a great high-energy uh, session. All of you at the bottom are, are speakers, are, are poster presenters, is that right? I'd like you to turn around and face the people at the back because I need to keep real control here. I just want you to look at the people at the back. People in the audience, please, uh, can you imagine it's an hour's time and you want to get to your coffee, please could you put your I want my coffee faces on, <laughs> right? Because these are the people that you have to respect, all right? And I'm going to try and keep them in abeyance. But in order to do that, you've got to stick to one minute. I'll have a timer here. I've been given uh, a whistle, the whistle of power. All right, I'll try and, try and make that a bit less camp. Um, and um, to, it, to try and encourage you to you know, sort of really think about how you're presenting and to, to keep this short, uh, ePrint Services will uh, buy uh, beer or other uh, drink for anyone who comes in under 45 seconds. All right? So efficiency of communication. Uh, <coughs> And we'll see how this how this works out. Oh, I propose we all just give a title, so we have to buy yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I really shouldn't have set off this thing about disruptive communities. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Right. So, um, are we ready? Um, we have a, we have 68 posters listed, uh, and we will try and do this in order. So, can I have the first? Is that the first? Oh, that is the first. That's excellent. Um, uh, who's, who's the speaker for this? Not here. That's embarrassing. Can we move on to the, ne the next one? Have we got a speaker here? Yes, uh, so, so you have a privilege. Can, can you move up to the center and start your presentation uh, now? Great. Uh, we just heard the reasoning for why we need data one. Uh, from the previous speakers. So right now we have thousands of siloed repositories. It's incredibly difficult for scientists to find the data they need. Data One is designed to do that, particularly right now focusing on the environmental and earth sciences data communities. It provides easy access to data worldwide, wherever they are, as well as access to tools that are tightly integrated with those data resources. And these tools are ones that scientists uh, use on a familiar day-to-day -day basis, like Excel, like SAS, like uh, R, MATLAB, and others. And you'll get a, a, a full Ten explanation seconds. of this when you come and visit the poster this evening. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Well done. Next poster, please. Thank you very much. Hi. 
My name is Maxi Kindling. I'm from Humboldt University. I'm presenting a project which is a prospective project. That means that we just submitted it to the German Research Foundation and the project aims to check and improve metadata quality. Um, it consists of three components. The first one is for the researchers themselves so they can check um, the metadata of their uh, publications by using the persistent identifier. The second one is for repository managers. They can check the quality of the metadata of their whole repository. And the third one is that we want to build a ranking based on the uh, quality of the metadata of repositories. And I would like you to come to my poster and discuss this idea with me. Okay, oh, with beer. Next one, please. I'm Agathe Gebert, heading the uh, Social Science Open Access Repository run by the Leibniz Institute for Social Sciences. SSOI is one of the leading poor subject repositories in Germany, covering uh, social science, economics, educational science, and psychology. In my poster presentation, I'd like to discuss the ideas about the role a subject repository like SSOI can take and how it's getting ready. Uh, among different acquisition strategies, strategies, I'd like to especially focus on uh, the cooperation SSOI succeeded in building with uh, commercial publishers to gain large quantity of uh, quality proven publications. Thank you. Please come and discuss it. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So, the open access directory, we have lists on open access, factual lists on open access, because open access is big, has grown, and if you want to find information, it's really difficult to find it, so we try to gather it together. Come see the poster, but most importantly, visit the website. We need the user's contribution to help us build more lists, clean up the lists that we have already, clear up URLs, clear up everything that doesn't look to be very good. Uh, the people behind them, Peter Suber from the United States and Robin Pick from Simmons College. It is hosted uh, at the Simmons College. Thank you. Thank you. And the next. Hi, I'm Krishnamurti from Bangalore. So uh, doing the library science information repositories in Indian universities, uh, particularly in Bangalore, we have about 12 universities, how their institution, the institutional repositories are initiating in the developing UGC network. UGC is University Grant Commission, commission how the, all the universities, about 350 universities in India, are important creating the institutional repository using DSpace. I'm one of the uh, project leader of this project. I'm initiating this LIS research in India. How faculties and research scholars they are contributing their papers in the repositories, and the faculties they expressed that still they are low awareness in the depositing the scholarly literature. With this, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh -huh. We want to raise the impact of our research. How are we going to do this? We're going to build open repositories, and you guys have done it. So thank you for doing it. But how well? are those repositories doing? The Pro Vice Chancellor of Bath University spotted that I had the largest number of downloads in Bath repository. How did you do that? Simple, I said, it's all about links. It's all about connectedness. My links, my connectedness, it comes from LinkedIn, academia, research gate. We need to encourage our researchers to link from those services out there to our research, but we don't do it. The commercial publishers encourage their researchers to link to the paywall content, but you guys don't encourage your researchers to link to the open access repositories. Why? Tell me why. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Just missed on the beer. Thank you very much. Three repository committees in Japan and the UK, the Digital Repository Federation, the Repository Support Project, and the United Kingdom Council of Research Repository decided to cooperate with respect to sharing experiences and expertise in the professional development of promoting open access and institu institutional repositories. Our poster described not only the similarities of the activities of each party, but also activities and ideas that the partners can take from each other and incorporate into future programs. So the establishment of a cooperative relationship will contribute to the further development of open access and institutional repositories in the two countries. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. 
Do we have Maria here? No? And on to the next one. Thank you very much. So that's me again. I hope the posters <laughs> are next to each other. Um, the second project I'm presenting is re3data.org. This is a project which is already funded by the German Research Foundation and it aims to build a um, registry of research data repositories. We want to support the storage and reuse of research data. We want to um, promote the culture of sharing research data and of open access to research data. And we are planning to do some research on the data we have in this uh, re3data.org. And if you want to know what plans do we have, so come to the poster and talk to me. Thank you very much. Ooh, you're getting two pints of beer. Do we have, no? And on to the next one. Hi, uh, this is Iki Koyama from uh, Graduate School of Kyoto University. Uh, I also belong to the w uh, World Data Center for Geomagnetism Kyoto. Uh, I'm a geoscientist. And uh, my presentation is the metadata database for upper atmosphere by using DSpace. DSpace is uh, used for not only a library, but also science database. Uh, uh, here in Japan, uh, there are so many databases uh, all around. Uh, 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 geomagnetism and something like that. But uh, those data databases are distributed. There are no way to cross-searching uh, at one query. Uh, for this metadata database will uh, solve the uh, issue for uh, cross-searching. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of uh, activity, please come to my uh, poster presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Nine posters, three beers so far. Oh, my name is Daisuke Ikeda uh, from Kyushu University, Japan. Uh, our research is about uh, analysis of real access raw data of our university repository, uh, aiming to uh, reveal uh, existence of known researchers uh, in the hid uh, hidden in the raw data. Uh, I think this is very important because uh, such users may have demands uh, different from researchers' demands. Uh, but uh, I think it is very uh, challenging uh, to segment uh, repository users into some categories because we don't have any information about users uh, except for their IP addresses. So I hope you can join us and share some findings such as uh, how we have overcome this challenge. Thank you. Fedora is renowned for its ability to store resources durably and reliably, as well as the semantic graph that relates them. The web, on the other hand, is not. But it's increasingly interesting to maintain content repositories in connection with the semantic web. This poster presents early results from experiments at the University of Virginia Library using Apache Stambul to mediate this durable semantic graph of a Fedora repository and a larger, wilder graph of the web. Stambul is a powerful suite of components for managing semantic data and content repositories that originated in the EU-funded Interactive Knowledge Stack project. If you're interested in how to take advantage of the semantic web without losing the long-term durability of your content, please come by and say hello. So I'm from the Open Knowledge Foundation. CCAN is a uh, free open source. Uh, it's basically a, a data catalog and a, a data store. If you ever used data.gov.uk, then you've used the data catalog uh, and you know what it's like. You can, you can find things uh, easily. It's got good uh, searching and things. Uh, the Data Hub um, is a public instance where anybody can uh, go and you can go and stick all your research there. So uh, Cameron Nayland was talking about openness from the right side as well as the read side. Um, you can put uh, you know, your PDFs, your, your Excel files, your whatever, your, your code repositories. Uh, it'll give you an API onto your data if you, and, and it'll give you sort of nice little graphs like this which you can embed in your web pages about it. Uh, you could run it as your entire repository if you liked you, or, or, or as a data store alongside your repository. You can download it and, and run your own and uh, come and talk to me. Thanks very much. Thank you. Is Mark here? No? Uh, maybe you uh, do not have the good chances to visit China, 
but at the moment you have good opportunities to understand the development development institutional report service in Chinese academic sciences. We have done much work on developing uh, value added services or maybe researchers de deserved services to attract uh, researchers to be to use the report intensively. Uh, how, how, how does this, how, how do these services look like? Please, uh, please refer to our report, uh, our post, or maybe just uh, uh, follow me after the meeting. Thank you. No? And the next one? Sydney? No? And the next one? Jackie. Oh. No, I can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story, okay? And this is all about a very sad, lonely repository. And it lived in a dark, dusty corner of the library, all sad and alone. Nobody talked to it inside or outside the institution, and it didn't talk to anybody. Every now and then, an author would come and throw it a morsel, an article, and it would be happy, but then it happened so rarely, you just sank back into depression. Are you, got your tissues out? Then one day, one day, the repository manager on, came across on the internet the RSP embedding guide. <laughs> <laughs> it was full of really good stuff, and if you want to find out, what's in it and how the story ended very happily then come see me. Ah! <laughs> Hi, I'm not Andrew, but I'm Michelle Kimpton from DuraSpace, and our poster is about DuraCloud. So we understand that digital preservation is a big challenge for many institutions that have repositories and want to be able to enable a digital, digital preservation strategy but have uh, aren't able to do it, making multiple copies and multiple geographies. So we've developed DuraCloud, which is an open source technology that runs on cloud infrastructure. It's available for any institution to download. We also offer it as a service through the DuraSpace organization. And what our poster will address is how do you actually check the integrity of your data when it's enabled in a cloud-based solution. There's lots of myths out there in terms of what Amazon or other commercial cloud providers do to check integrity, and we will debunk the myths by telling you what they do do and what Dur the DuraCloud solution will do for you. Yep. Uh, repositories create social value by capturing, describing, curating, and making accessible content. This generates huge bodies of high value uh, material that has to be preserved. And, and the cornerstone of preservation, the first step, is replication, creating managed distributed copies of content. Okay? There are many good tools emerging in this space that assist in this, tools and services. One Michelle just described, uh, cloud-based services such as uh, uh, DuraCloud's uh, replication services. There are some that are uh, local-based, for instance, LOX, which is a, a long-lived peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, protocol for replication. Um, what, what it's difficult to do with these tools, however, is to prove any relationship between these important replication activities and, and a policy, okay? Safe Archive gives you that. <laughs> <laughs> I got to blow my whistle. <laughs> Kit, no, Kaita. Oh, yes. Konnichiwa. Uh, my name is Kaita. Uh, I'm, uh, I am a managing director of my open archive. Uh, if you know me already, uh, you are social media lunatic. Uh, my, my archive was founded in September 2007, and uh, we provide, uh, we advocate open access for uh, unpublished research papers. And we provide an open access repository uh, in, in November 2000, uh, 2010. 
my product I relaunched a, relaunched a social media base, based open access repository. Uh, at present, my open archive is one of the most smallest repository, uh, but we are well known around social media Atlantic. Uh, on my poster, I would like to discuss this title, and if you are interested in old metrics, uh, very welcome to see my poster. Uh -huh. Thank you. Hello, my name is Daniel Stein. I'm from the University of Hamburg. Um, I'm working there as a linguist, and we're working with corpora of spoken language. Um, spoken language corpora, this means um, these are recorded communications between speakers, but I'll come back to this later in my minute. Um, <laughs> linguists from all over the world are using uh, this data for uh, topics like second language acquisition but this kind of data type is uh, really hard to um, process and expensive to, uh, to produce. Um, so we need a repository and a data model that uh, reflects the, this kind of um, data type. Um, this data type uh, consists of recordings and audio, video quality, semantically and syntactically annotated text transcriptions and nonlinear XML files extensive metadata about the situation they recorded in and the speakers and researchers that were involved and as well possibly additional data. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Better. Okay. You escape. Thank you. Hi. Is it hot in here? Is anybody hot? Anybody hot? Uh, well, come to my poster and you will find out all about hot topics and perhaps get a little bit hotter. <laughs> there is this notion that people are talking about stuff in our community. And Hot Topics is a web seminar series that's set up to address those issues that are bubbling up from the ground up in our community. We just had a very successful one run by Karen Cariani, WGBH, on audio and video in repositories. And we have others planned for 2012. So talk to me about the series and perhaps how you can get involved. Thank you. You're feeling there are so many Japanese people here. We are paying a lot of <laughs> money to the British Airways. Uh, my name is Kaz from NII Japan. Um, our institution, NII, is working as a inter-university institution and sometimes funding like uh, just sometimes networking like uh, Janet UK and sometimes um, databasing or ID federation managing like uh, Edina Hugh. And recently we've started new service named uh, new service for the institutional repository uh, hosting service named Jailo Cloud. My colleague will uh, talk a bit in detail later. And we're also uh, offering a, a electronic journal uh, platform service for the, uh, to the Japanese academic societies. And we'll try to tie each other. We will try to make a handshake each other. And how to do that, maybe we don't have that. <laughs> I'll talk, uh, please come to my poster. I will explain in detail. <laughs> Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Tanya Stoyanova and I am from the New Bulgarian University in Sofia. This is our poster. Its topic is Create a Track Deposit or how to increase the deposits of non-traditional content in our repository. For example, exhibitions, images, music pieces, music and audio files, video files, and etc. The specific software platform we use and the Web 2.0 tools we use helped us to increase this number from 0.7 to 2% just in half a year. You are all welcome to see it in detail and to share knowledge and to understand how we promote these materials. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, the Engage project is a current project part funded by the JISC Business Intelligent Program. What we've done is we've taken Research Council activity classifications and we've used smart technology 
to visualise and to help improve the searching to make better use of the information from our repository. Um, and I look forward to seeing anyone at our stand come and tell me your ideas and any issues that you've encountered. Thank you. Oh, that's a double, I think. Thank you. Hiya, uh, Isabel Bernal from the Spanish National Research Council. This poster could be of interest for research institutions that are thinking about creating their own homegrown trees and linking it to the institutional repository. For the last two years at the Council, we've been working on a new system to manage uh, data on, on scientific outputs. The first part of the project has been to develop a homegrown uh, software for the CRIS. I, um, we've been using also different external sources to automate uh, content ingestion. Uh, in the poster, I could talk about pros and cons and experiences about Scopus documentation APIs we've been using. The second part of the uh, poster uh, talks about the integration we've done with the uh, this space institutional repository, how this space submission system has become secondary, and we are uh, using CRIS to automate deposits in the in the repository. <laughs> if you want to know about headaches, <laughs> technical problems come. <laughs> Fabrizio? No? Um, from Japan again. Um, <laughs> sometimes I imagine if I was transferred to a smaller university and, and they asked to construct an institutional repository with um, very limited cost. Um, I'm not a tech person and don't have much money, so um, that would be too demanding. Um, in Japan, there are about 800 universities. Of them, 600 are in trouble with such situation. So we, the National Institute of Informatics, had started to uh, provide a shared repository on our private cloud system from this April. Um, surprisingly, we have received 73 applicants. Of them, 17 repositories are already open to the public. Well done. So um, also, it's expected that uh, collected data uh, in a crowd system enables us to uh, have an opportunity for expanding new service or new experiment. Thank you. Hello. I'm holding an image of William Wallace. This is a statue of William Wallace. And he, uh, for those who can't see it, he, is, uh, he has in his hands uh, Core, uh, an Apple Core. Core is the name of our project called Connecting Repositories, spelled C-O-R-E. And there is one similarity uh, with our project and William Wallace, and hopefully one difference. The similarity is that William Wallace uh, is, was fighting for freedom in Scotland. Uh, we are fighting for freedom in terms of open access, and we are do have a project which aggregates uh, content and provides access to millions of resources. And the, the difference is hopefully that we won't end up in the same way because William Willis was um, hanged, <laughs> <laughs> then he was drawn, and finally he was quartered. So if you are interested, please come to our poster. Goodness knows how the English publishers will treat us though. <laughs> Hi, I'm Manuela from Brazil. Anyone from Brazil? <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm here to present the LUMI. LUMI is the digital repository of Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. It aims at fostering the dissemination of digital content produced in the context of this university. A detailed diagram showing Lumi's customized usage of this space is presented, highlighting the developed extensions that allow the synchronization of Lumi with several data sources with distinct, distinct updating patterns, and how the provision of embedded videos will be enabled. Please visit Lumi. Thank you. Thank you.
I all uh, I want to re I want you to remember two ideas of this poster. First, uh, we are talking about uh, an institutional repository, which means several million files in 23 languages. We are talking about the European Union, and uh, we are doing so. Second idea, with a number of standards: METS, RDF, SCOS, OWL, uh, Fedora and disseminating it in RESTful interface and Spark World. And that's it. Oh. <laughs> okay. Hi. Uh, my poster is uh, about a new open source module for uh, your uh, institution repository built uh, on uh, the space platform. It enables you to collect and uh, disseminate uh, CRIS information. So you can extend the data model of the space so that uh, not only publication is exposed to the world. And uh, please, we like to see this module installed, uh, deployed on uh, your local home, on your local uh, university. So please go to my poster and uh, talk with me in detail. And, uh, See you later. Hi, I'm Andrew Mwesigwa from Uganda, Makere University. I'm a librarian and in charge of the repository there. We've been using this space for about five years for our institutional repository. And uh, this poster is basically about sharing our experience where we've been um, the major factors that have uh, brought us this far and we're here to learn to go to the next level to take our repository to the next level so you're welcome to my poster Clever enough not to turn up, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Back one. Back. That's one. That's it. Right. Fine. Thank you. Okay. So we have some very active historians at the University of Hull, and some of them produced uh, some data which helped to seed data within our institutional repository. And off the back of that, we got this JISC-funded program to go out to the project to go out and talk to the historians and say, "What other data do you have? Would you like us to help us manage it for you?" To which the answer was, "Yes, please." Uh, and that gave us the wherewithal to develop a data management plan based on the checklist of questions from the Digital Curation Center. And so we now have a fully fle featured data management plan for historians so that they can go away and manage their data properly. Um, we were able to test that using three use cases based on uh, preparing a project, running a project, what comes after a project. And we were also, from a repository point of view, able to enhance our repository to properly manage the data sets, which were now being given to us as a result of the data management ta planning activity. Come and talk more. We've now had 30. We're halfway through. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. I'm Susan Parham from the Georgia Tech Library. In the first eight months of 2011, um, Georgia Tech researchers submitted close to 400 grant proposals to the National Science Foundation. With each of these proposals, they had to submit a two-page data management plan. As the institutional repository manager, I wanted to know what kinds of crazy things they were saying about the institutional <laughs> repository in their data management plans. And they were saying some crazy things. So if you come to my poster, you'll hear all about them. <laughs> Woo! That's too bad. My poster looks much better than this. Um, at, uh, my name's Mark Ratliff. I'm from Princeton University. Uh, recently, Princeton adopted uh, Drupal as its enterprise web content management system. Uh, as departments, academic departments, approached our development group to migrate their sites into Drupal, uh, they often had uh, working papers, reports, other types of publications that we wanted to deposit in the repository. Uh, they were fine with depositing their content in the repository, but they wanted it to look the way that their website looked, the way that their new websites looked. So we developed a relatively simple 
Drupal module for doing that. It uses the DSpace REST API to extract uh, collection metadata from DSpace, creates Biblio nodes in Drupal, which can be displayed, viewed, sorted, searched any way that that academic department wants. So if you're interested in using, if you're interested in using the, uh, So this poster is about Databib. Databib.org is an online curated uh, bibliography or catalog of research data repositories. So we have over 200 research data repositories that have been cataloged. You may be a researcher who is writing a data management plan or producing data and you wonder where you can submit your data to. You can go to Databib.org and you can find an appropriate data repository. You may be a librarian. You have a patron who comes to you and wants to know where to find data in their discipline you can use databib.org to find a research data repository that's appropriate to meet their information needs. And you may be a, re a repository manager who manages significant research data collections in your repository, in which case I hope you'll stop by my poster or visit databib.org and make sure that your repository is represented. Um, I wanted to mention that we have um, the website, but we also uh, make all of our metadata available using CC0. You can integrate with databib using RSS, open search, you can download the records in RDFXML, RDFA. Hello, my name is Tara Stevens from the University of British Columbia, and I also have a little story to tell in 60 seconds. Uh, in the early days, Circle was like a lot of digital repositories. We were a pilot project run by volunteers. We were a lot like a garage band. We had a lot of good songs, but only our mom and moms and boyfriends would come to hear us play. But like many repositories and the better garage bands, we got better with practice, we developed new skills, we expanded our repertoire, and we started spreading the word. As our reputation grew, so did our fan base. They got bigger and they got more influential. High profile, high profile researchers on campus are starting to recognize our name. They say, I've heard of you. I like your stuff. Give me a call. I'd like to work with you. They want to jam with us. My poster, Making It Work, is about this transition from side project to integrated library service in other digital repositories and academic institutions. It's about sharing the strategies and actions that have worked and are working for us to help other digital repositories move from garage band to center stage. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lucie Vichitala from uh, University of Pardubice. We launched uh, our DSpace repository in 2007, and last year we decided to ask our journals uh, to convert to open journal system. Uh, the, uh, the reactions were very positive, and uh, the library will, will provide the support to the system, and. Uh, and also we will inform and promote the open access. In my opinion, it's a good way how to inform and to get open access uh, uh, matters to academics. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Felix Schüler from The Carpet Project. The Carpet Project is an information platform on the technical solutions of e-publishing. We collect collaboratively the information on e-publishing technology in a certain location in order to help users, developers, and providers. But how? Users of e-publishing software can browse our catalog for e-publishing software and services, searching for fitting solutions for the specific requirements, and use our community to get in touch with developers and other users. Developers and providers, on the other hand, can use our platform to present the solutions and to contact potential and to support existing users. All the services, catalog, forum, knowledge base, and news blog are fully open and free of charge and presented in our poster. So please come to our poster. Don't hesitate to ask me how we can help you. Thank you. It's OK. I'm OK. Don't worry. <laughs> so I'm Nikos uh, Husos from EKT in Greece. Just had a sudden change from the 40 degrees heat wave in Athens to a nice refreshing <laughs> day in the summer. Uh, so this is probably because of that. <laughs> so great to be here. Uh, our poster is about proactive personalized self archiving. So we have built an application which runs outside the repository and enables uh, users 
for example, authors or secretaries of research groups or whatever, to submit metadata and uh, full text to repositories. It's proactive because we prepare uh, lists of publications that should be archived for them and notify them of that. Uh, it's personalized because they can create custom queries with, with alternative uh, writings of names, subjects, and so on. And uh, uh, the tricky part is to make that, uh, let's say, repository independent. So this is uh, quite challenging. We have made a lot of progress with that. This is still work in progress in some sense. We'll be happy to discuss with you on this. Hi, I'm Stephanie Taylor from the Dataflow Project Oxford. Um, like Jackie, I wanted to tell you a little story. Um, this one's a love story about two systems that were made for each other but didn't know it. Um, we have a data, uh, data bank, which is an archive uh, for digital objects, and um, data stage, which is a personalized file management system. Um, the data flow project brought these two lovebirds together um, and they, they can work in perfect harmony with each other. Um, data bank you'll hear more about shortly. Data stage can offer personalized file access. It can be integrated into the systems that people already use, so it can be put in Excel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, can also ha it also has access controls, so you can look at it on a group level um, and on personal level, and you can even collaborate with people external to your institution. We are an open access project, um, and in the interests of open access, this is also an open relationship between data bank and data stage. If you have already got one of the components yourself, they are very <laughs> Hi all, I'm Anusha, oh, I'm from Oxford. You already heard from Stephanie about data stage. This is data bank, it's a data archive. Um, it's available to the community for you all to use. So come and discuss the architecture of Data Bank, if it'll be useful to you all in your, in your institution as a data repository, um, the pros and cons of it. We'd love to talk about it. Data Bank. Go. Hi, um, I'm Yvonne Budden from the University of Warwick. Um, our poster is about a short project we ran um, looking at finding a way to refresh our um, advocacy <coughs> strategies for the repository. Uh, we ran a seven-step marketing toolkit to um, analyze our services, our users, and the things we were planning to do in the future. Um, from, the, from this analysis, we developed a single strap line, highlight your research, um, which we've used to develop a strong visual brand for the repository, which we're using on our marketing materials, our poster, and also on our ePrints um, service. We launched, um, we launched the service um, late last year, and in the first 10 months of the service, we saw a rise in full text deposits of nearly 50% um, based on the refreshed advocacy strategy and the, the, the higher profile we were getting from the thing. So if you want to learn more about the process we went through um, and the our end projects, please come and talk to me. Oh, well done. <laughs> on the button. I wish I had a massive iPad. Um, uh, so this uh, poster uh, is a uh, chronological narrative slash fairy tale uh, that traces the development of the virtual research environment service at uh, the University of Prince Edward Island and somewhat of Islandora itself uh, and our attempts at uh, creating a model that ensures uh, the sustainability of the service. If you're a small institution trying to figure out how to make your repository go, I'd love to hear from you. Or if you're successful and you've got lots of institutional support and funding, that'd be terrific. It's 25 degrees Celsius in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island today. So 2013, come to the island. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Stroming from uh, Northwestern University Library, and I'm a software developer. Um, we're developing a suite of three Fedora-based applications. Each supports a distinct user group, serves an exclusive purpose, and utilizes a unique open source technology. Together, they serve as a digital asset management platform. So we have um, a Drupal-based workflow system, um, a Hydra-based system for discovery and editing, 
and an Orbian XForms uh, tool for cataloging. So this is fun stuff, and we should talk. Probably the last Japanese. Uh, <laughs> and my post is simple, and the idea is simple also. So uh, one of the typical application of digital repository is to manage and construct the repository overlay uh, by a relatively small research groups. But uh, it is it requires a certain amount of efforts to to manage and construct. Uh, repository overlay by hand. So uh, in my poster presentation, uh, client size JavaScript library, uh, which supports to cons construct and manage the repository overlay system uh, with an extension of OAI PMH facility. Uh, the extension is to provide OAI image output by JSON format, and uh, based on the extension, repository overlay could be uh, constructed more flexibly. Uh, there should be a various framework which supports such an overlay system. Uh, I think this is a very uh, useful uh, framework. <laughs> could I just see, could you put your hand up if you still have a poster to go? Because we had some missing one. Oh, just a few nearly there at coffee time. Thank you very much. Do we have um, Srita here? No? Helen? Yes. Hi, I'm Helen Kenner, University of Salford. Um, we've been developing a number of open access archive collections using ePrints as software, um, using ePrint software as the infrastructure to deliver them. We've been digitizing lots of non-traditional content from our university-owned archives, as well as working with our local community to help make those collections more widely available. New metadata workflows have been developed, um, and we've worked closely with the curators of each collection to make sure that this metadata is appropriate to the content. We've also used the ePrints call to plugin to enhance the display of this content within our system. Our poster, if you love them, set them free, tells a short story of how we're developing our printed archive collections in order to make them more discoverable for people to use, appreciate, and enjoy. Thank you. University of St Andrews, and welcome to my co-author Jackie, who's the woman with the props as well. Okay, a little story first uh, to echo Jackie. Uh, legend has it that one of the earliest recorded journeys made to St Andrews was by a fourth-century monk. St Regulus is said to have had a dream in which an angel appeared with instructions to take the bones of St Andrews to the very ends of the earth for safekeeping. Okay, St Andrews may be remote, but it's deeply connected throughout the world. <coughs> 600 years ago, scholars were drawn to this corner of Scotland and a seat of learning was established. Today, researchers are still inspired to come to St Andrews, to push at the frontiers of knowledge and to communicate their research on a global scale. Inspired by ethnographic encounters, which is one of our hosted open access journals, our poster describes how our encounters at a local level have led to unexpected encounters with, contact, with content and on a global scale. We illustrate the flexible infrastructure, coordinated services, collaboration across support units, lots of engagement with researchers, <coughs> and the discoveries of synergy and interdependency. Come and see our flexible <coughs> of encounters. <laughs> Hi, hi. I'm, my name is Kirsta. I'm part of a team that's come to Edinburgh to promote Islandora, which is open source repository software not well represented by this question mark. The architecture diagram I'll be standing in front of later today provides an introduction to the applications Islandora leverages and describes how portions of the system interact 
to allow for ingesting, transforming, securing, and discovering Fedora assets through Drupal, the very popular CMS, flexible enough that it's been installed by everybody from NASA to Playboy. So if you do not know what Islandora is, come and find out. If you are a current developer or implementer of Islandora, find out what's new in 7. Or just come and, talk to, come and talk to me to find out more about Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, where we're going to be proud to be hosting OR 2013. So hope to see you later. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> later on, Mark Leggett, who has a gray beard and looks very little like me, will be standing beside a poster that does not look like this question mark either. Uh, that maps Islandora to the OAI reference model and talks a little bit about some of the preservation services that we're now implementing in Islandora, notably the DuraCloud service. So we're, we're, we've got a beta module that integrates with that service. So we'd like to talk about that, talk to other people and their feelings about the OAI reference model. So yes, Greybeard, not me. I can probably point you to him. He'll probably be there, maybe with scotch. <laughs> Last but not least, um, sharing science is a major issue. You build up um, open repositories and academic portals, but um, sharing science is also networking. So VOR, the acronym for Virtual Social, uh, Virtual Open <coughs> Access uh, Repository, uh, is a, a portal, uh, an open source uh, portal that first harvest uh, scientific, open access scientific literature um, from um, plenty of different uh, institutional repository or thematic repositories. And second, um, it embarks uh, a social network. Um, um, this uh, project, VOR, uh, has been funded by the European Commission under the uh, frame, uh, framework um, program seven. And uh, the technology uh, is reusable and open source. Oh, hello. No mercy. So if you like repositories with lots of open access content and high quality metadata, but hate the manual work that's involved, Come and find out how ULCC have combined a full text harvester with symplectic elements to populate a repository automatically for St. George's University of London. Oh, no denying that one. I want to tell you a story. <laughs> um, about sausages, sausages, SAS open journals. Uh, last year, just funded School of Advanced Study and the University of London Computer Centre to develop the SAS Open Journals service using uh, a journal of the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies as a pilot case. So we've integrated the PKP Open Journal system with ePrints uh, using Sword to Deposit and uh, the social networking extensions. Uh, editors and authors get the benefit of the OGS workflow and the university manages the articles sustainably in ePrints. So if you want to talk about sausages and find out how you might want to do this yourself, then come and see me later. <laughs> ah, Paula. Many institutional repositories have got <coughs> linkages with their research information system, um, and in most cases, the publication details are drawn from the research information system into the repository. This can create lots of records, but in some cases, it doesn't provide open access copies, although I will be checking out that on the poster. Um, at QUT, we decided to do it the other way around, and we've made the um, repository the only point of deposit for data entry about new publications. And uh, this has resulted in lots of the open access copies. Um, of course, there were technical issues and people issues to be resolved, so the poster will cover how we did this. <laughs> so, me again, um, although I'm speaking on behalf of two people here. Um, usage statistics can be a great motivator in terms of getting 
downloadable content into your repository. And usage statistics at the individual level are great, but our research has told us that they would also appreciate usage statistics that were collated across all of their publications to save them having to do the maths to work out the total downloads and, and other usage. So we've developed a number of dashboards that collate statistics at the author level, at the research group level or school or faculty, and also at the whole of repository level, as well as having them at the individual level. Um, my poster explains how we did this technically and um, how well it's gone down. Thank you. Oh, next one. Right, that's me. I'm oh, the no. Next one. There you are. I'm going to tell you a story, but I'm going to tell you a bad poem. What's all the fuss about Open Air Plus? Well, it's open air with a bit of a flair. Right now, it's FP7 that we harvest, but other funded publications are also our target. But that's not all we're thinking, because we're also about linking, yep, from publication to data, making the research richer, enhanced, how very advanced and investigating, investigating legal and licensing issues, ensuring the reuse of data won't be a breach. We're all about a network, communicating outreach. We touch on data training and much supporting, building our services for managers, researchers, statistics and reporting. It's open access of which we're in favor with a very European flavor. So add some continental chic to your OR12. Come and find out about which into which topics we delve, whether European open science or even open air compliance. So no shirking. Join us at our posters, both technical and networking. Oh, well. Hello. Well, of course, to do all such nice things, you need the humble technicians in the background. So the next part to see is about how the technical development have been uh, carried out to develop a data infrastructure that is capable of connecting these research outcomes with um, funding um, uh, schemes. Uh, we actually collect from heterogeneous data sources, ranging from CRIS systems to repositories and data archives, um, including author uh, um, uh, registries like ORCID, for example. And in this data infrastructure, we deal with issues with such as deduplications, inference of uh, different relationships, and so on. It's open, it's open to new uh, possible uh, solutions of this kind, and it's reusable, of course, by others. Uh, it also opens up its content, of course, to all those who want to use it, from portals to applications. So if you come to my posters, I will gladly try to explain uh, how our, our solutions have been uh, implemented. That's it. Uh, is there anyone here who f f feels they haven't given their poster yet? Have we skipped over anyone? No. Could, every, could you please give a hand to all of our Minute Madness contestants? And I can tell you that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 people who will be getting drinks for keeping there, especially to time. Thank you very much. Uh, Kev, I think you probably want to say something about the break and what's next? Uh, yeah, uh, coffee is now available back uh, in the Appleton Tower. For those of you who don't know how to get there, 